Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Tim Rowland. I'm the chief exec of Future Trees Trust. Welcome to our annual Supporters Day, which this year, as you can see, we're holding via Zoom. Um, it was an auspicious day for, um, for Broadleaf Woodlands yesterday with the publication of the England Tree Strategy. And so without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to Sir William Worsley, who's going to make an opening address for us. Sir William, as I'm sure many of you will know, is chair of the Forestry Commission, um, ex-chairman of the National Forest uh, Company, and until recently was the government's national tree champion. A passionate enthusiast for all things arboreal, we're delighted to count Sir William as um, a key supporter of our work. Um, over to you, Sir William. Well, well, Tim, thank you very much indeed. It's, it's a, a real pleasure to be speaking with you today. Um, I, I'm sure, like me, you're um, now quite accustomed to conducting meetings like this over the video. And, and while that's been keeping us all going, keeping the world turning over, I, I'm really sorry that um, I'm not able to be with you in person. I, I, I think my, my dog is getting rather fed up of being the only person in the audience when I give a speech. She's, she's not really very interested in what I talk about anyway. Um, I, I know that many of you will welcome the opportunity to combine hearing about um, Future Tree Trust's work with, with a guided tour of interesting woods. And I'm sure that next year, that will certainly be the plan. And I, I really look forward to, to meeting people face to face. It'll be so nice. Now, as Tim hinted, this has been an incredibly exciting week so far. And it's only Wednesday. Yesterday, I was at Delamere Forest in Cheshire with uh, George Eustace, the Secretary of State, for the launch of the England Trees Action Plan. He made the inarguable point that we must act now to leave future generations a better environment. We need to work towards net zero emissions by 2050, to address biodiversity loss, to better connect people with nature and to create more green jobs. Now, trees are central the government's plan to achieve this. And the England Trees Action Plan sets out how these ambitious goals will be delivered. My, my good week continues, of course, being here with you today for the Future Trees Trust annual supporters event. Their achievements over 30 years have been really impressive and I'm delighted with the progress that they're making. In, in recent years, thanks to the or thanks to a, a transformative grant from the Patsy Wood Trust, they put much energy into engaging young foresters into their work, which we hope will ensure that this excellent program may continue. It's, it's a great fortune that I get to speak to you today, for less than 24 hours after the launch of the England Trees Action Plan. At the heart of the plan is a commitment to greatly increase woodland creation in England. This ambition will be supported through the England Woodland Creation Offer, a new major tree planting grant uh, scheme that um, which will be aimed at farmers and landowners and full details of this will be launched later this spring, I hope um, before very long. Um, I'm confident it represents a compelling offer for those with an interest in tree planting. But as well as setting out how we can make sure tree planting is an attractive proposition for landowners, farmers, and communities, the plan talks about how we better protect and manage our woods, how we ensure the right trees are planted in the right place and how we increase public access. I know the work of the Future Trees Trust aligns well with most of these objectives. I'm pleased that, that, that the Future Trees Trust is, is currently working hard to improve broadleaf yields and quality. Anyone planting trees with an eventual objective of producing a timber crop needs good planting stock from their nurseries. And as more of this stock becomes available, it's important that its use is championed by the sector. Growing good quality, healthy, productive broadleaf trees that will ultimately produce a valuable timber crops in everybody's interests. 
and will help us to reach that ambitious tree planting target. My involvement with the England Trees Action Plan started three years ago when I was appointed the government's tree champion. So I'm delighted that my personal engagement with it will continue as chair of the Forestry Commission. And I'm aware that the plan heralds a time of profound change for the sector and us as an organization. And we'll make sure that the right trees are planted in the right place. We'll promote a modern approach to sustainable forestry and we'll provide the right science, support and incentives to make tree planting and woodland creation and management attractive prospects for landowners, investment, investors and communities. But, but we cannot do it alone. Massively increasing woodland creation in a few short years will be a national effort involving government, land managers, foresters, NGOs and community groups. I'm delighted that the Future Trees Trust's important work will play a part in helping us to realize the great ambition the England Trees Action Plan sets out. Events like today's webinar focused on breathing new light into our woodlands have a key role to play in bringing together the right people at the right time to discuss the right things because they provide an important platform from which we can work to achieve our shared goal of increasing woodland cover in a way that benefits everyone. The agenda for today is truly impressive and I've no doubt a lot of important ground will be covered and I look forward to the discussions. So thank you for having me with you here today. And as I said at the beginning, I, I really do hope that I shall be able to see you all in person at next year's event. So Tim, back to you and, and thank you for inviting me um, to give the, the introductory address. Thank you, Sir William. That was that was most inspiring. That's really, really lovely. Thank you so much. Um, so now, without any further ado, on to our, our first scientist speaker today. I'd like to introduce you all to, to Joe Clark. Uh, with more than 20 years experience in the field of tree improvement, Joe brings a wealth of knowledge to her role at Future Trees Trust, where she's been our full-time head of research since we received the Patsy Wood Trust grant that supports her role um, back in 2017. Um, do do um, remember that uh, you can ask questions at any time in the chat box, but um, over to you, Joe. Okay, thank you, Tim. I hope everybody can see that okay. Um, so I'm Head of Research at Future Trees Trust, and I thought I would just start by giving um, a quick overview of what we do and then an introduction to some of the speakers later on today. So the, the mission at Future Trees Trust is the aim to get improved seed, and by this we want, we're interested in seed in the qualified and tested categories to market for main commercial broadleaf species. And for those of you who aren't aware, all trees are marketed under the forestry productive material regulations that places material into four categories, source identified and selected seed stands. But at Future Trees Trust, we're interested in, in getting slightly better material to, to market, and this falls into the qualified and tested uh, sources of FRM. So I'll just run over through briefly how we go about doing that. So we start off by identifying the very best parent trees based on their phenotype. This is what they look like in those um, source identified and selected stands. So we select the very best. And we can collect graftwood sign material from these best parent trees, which we then use to create clonal seed orchards. And we've been doing this work for a number of years, and we have these ready that are producing qualified seed for sycamore, cherry and birch, and also ash, oak and chestnut. But we can actually go a bit further than that, go a step further. And we actually want to understand the, the genetic worth of each of our individual plus trees, our parent trees. So to do that, we have to carry out progeny testing. And we collect the seed and plant these out in statistically robust uh, replicated trials so that we can test the worth of each of our parent trees in our breeding programs so that we know which are the best to take forward for seed production. And we have progeny trials for ash, 
oak and small ones for sycamore. And we are in the planning stages of putting out bigger, better uh, sycamore progeny trials and also starting with birch progeny trials. So that's the core of what we do. But all of this um, takes a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of work. And we're quite a small charity. So we work with partners to um, deliver some of our other goals. So we're working with partners to bring some more minor species to, um, to the market. We also are working with forest research and partners funded by DEFRA, working through the Living Ash Project to identify and produce uh, ash trees that are tolerant to ash dieback to uh, Clara or Hymenoscyphus. But we also commission research and um, we have, through the Patsy Wood Trust, we've commissioned two PhDs and you're going to be hearing from those today. And why this work is important? Well, here, a few years ago, we were fortunate enough to go on a, a, a visit to the Netherlands that have got a long history of breeding really fine quality oak. And this is a seed stand that has uh, now been deselected. And it shows dysgenic selection where the best trees have been removed over a number of years. And this was the resulting seed crop that's been uh, planted out as a seed stand. And you can see that the form of these trees is, is really very, very poor. And you wouldn't be very happy with this if this were your, your stand for timber. But here is another uh, stand. Uh, this is a seed stand on their register for uh, um, selected material. And you can immediately see that the quality is so much better. And this is the sort of trees that we are interested in being able to produce so that landowners, foresters planting uh, material from our breeding programs can be assured that what they're planting is good quality and going to yield a really good timber crop at the end of that long term investment. So I'm just going to briefly focus on oak because there are quite a few issues with oak besides all the, um, the problems around tree health um, and acute oak decline. Um, from a, a seed production point of view, oak masks very infrequently in the UK. And on our, our visit to the Netherlands, we were quite surprised when they report that actually they get a mast year every year in the Netherlands. So we really wanted to understand what is going on in the UK um, that we don't get a, a crop every year. And to this end, we are supporting Ryan McClory through his PhD based at Reading, who is looking into the drivers of oak masting. And the Forestry Commission managed this register of, of FRM. And on that, there are 117 seed stands registered for oak, but only 56 of these stands fall into the select category. And actually, most of these are not actually managed for acorn production. And to get a good crop, you need to thin around your tree so you've got a lot of space for your crown. And you need to manage the understory vegetation so that people can actually collect the acorns. Another problem is that they're recalcitrant. This means that they don't store very well. So although we do get mast years, we aren't able to collect those, all those acorns and store them for successive years when we don't get enough. So this is another problem. And it means that sometimes acorns are brought in from the continent and some of these sources may be maladapted to British growing conditions. So we need more managed select seed stands for oak. We need further research to increase the acorn storage time. There is work going on by partners, by Forest Research have done some work on this, but we've not been able to stretch that storage time more than a year. And also we need research to promote the oak flowering. But there are other problems with oak too. We're, we've collected a lot of our plus trees to go into clonal seed orchards for oak, but because um, oak only masts so infrequently, a clonal seed orchard, a CSO for oak, will only reforest an area twice its size each year. So we need lots of seed orchards to get lots of acorns. But oak is extremely hard to graft when the material is mature. Once we've managed to graft it, once we rejuvenate that tree and it becomes a lot easier, but it's really actually very difficult and we only get about 50% success rate. And we get incompatibilities even after several years of successful grafting. Further to this, there's a correlation between trees that have large vessel size. These are the cells in the tree that take the water um, up from the roots up to the crown. And this has been associated with shake. And shake is a timber defect. And there are two types of shake, um, star shake and ring shake. And um, there's this correlation between large vessel size and shake. And, and shake means that um, when the tree comes to be uh, milled, actually the, the timber falls apart on the mill, on the soil mill. So, and this is particularly associated with fluctuating water tables. So this is something 
also that we consider in our breeding programs. And we're really pleased that we've been able to support Sam Henderson through his PhD. Um, and he's going to be talking to you a little bit about this um, further down the program. So this is how we go about it. On the left, you see um, a oak plus tree. And typically we would shoot for the top of the crown to get our sign material for species that are easy to graph like ash or sycamore. But for oak, because it's so difficult, we really want the best quality graft wood that we can possibly get. So we use tree climbers to get right up to the top of the crown and get that really young material from the outermost branches of the crown. And then in the middle at the top, you see those grafts. Once they're made, they're placed on a hot pipe. This is where the graft union is placed on a heated pipe, which just helps the callus formation. And below you see where they've come off the hot pipe. And then one year later, we have a one year exact genetic copy of that plus tree that we can plant into our clonal seed orchards. And we've been doing this for a number of years now. Remember I said we want to get that material rejuvenated and then it's much, uh, we get much better success rate in our grafting. So we're really delighted that Backhouse Wood with Jim and Mary Reed in Kent are hosting an archive site. So these, these trees are planted close together as a hedge and it looks at the moment like a, a row of tubes, but um, this photo was taken a couple of years ago and they're growing really well. And then we've got three different clonal seed orchards, two for Petraea and one for Roba, uh, that we started planting in 2018. But because this work is so costly and takes us so long, uh, we're planting these up uh, every year successively. And we hope, um, we've been doing this for three years now. And unfortunately, we delayed this year because of COVID. We couldn't get out and about with our climbers in January. But we're hoping uh, two more years of climbing and we will have full uh, complement of clones in our clonal seed orchards. But to go a little bit further, remember I said we needed to do the progeny testing to understand uh, the performance of each individual parent tree. And these are oak progeny trials that we planted in 2013. And here we are doing 18 year um, assessments. These are the final assessments because we've, we've been measuring these trials over many, many years. We've got several very big um, data sets there are eight of these trials right across the UK. And on the left, we've got the trial in Worcestershire, which has the same uh, parent trees. And on the right, you've got the trial in Oxfordshire. And um, what you maybe can't quite tell is the trial on the left at, at uh, Shakenhurst in Worcestershire, the average height of those trees is 10 metres. And you can see different, prov uh, different properties of different parents because the tree on the left in the front, you can see it's quite bendy. But if you look on the right and further down the rows, you can see the form of, of different, different progeny is actually much better. The trial on the right in uh, Little Whitnam in Oxfordshire, same families planted at the same time, same age, but the average height in that trial is only seven meters. So we can see that we have progeny differences and we have site differences. So we've now this winter measured all these trees. We're also carrying out bud burst assessments, the timing of when these uh, families come into leaf so that we can look at variation in that too. And um, obviously we're trying to find trees that flush late because they're less likely to get uh, damaged by frost um, from those late spring frosts that Britain is notorious for, which can lead to poor form. So moving on, going forward, we're really excited to be establishing new progeny trials for sycamore and birch. And uh, just a few weeks ago, Joe and I went to Clumber Park in the Central Forest District, uh, where Forestry England are going to be hosting a birch progeny trial for us. We're quite excited about this, it's a fantastic site. And we've got um, other sites with other people around the country, and we've got a sycamore site with uh, Kate Harris in the um, Kent uh, Forest District. So that's also great news. And as I said, the purpose of these progeny trials is to evaluate the traits so that we calculate breeding values. And we can also use this data from our progeny trials to look at the composition of the clones in our clonal seed orchards. And once we know the performance of those individual families, it means that we can rogue, we can cull the poorer performing trees out of our clonal seed orchards. And this will then mean that we can move them up to that test at that highest category of FRM, which is really what the ultimate goal is here. And just to say that all, all progeny trials are large, very genetically diverse. And this means so we're, the new ones we're putting out will have a minimum of 100 families so that we can actually 
rogue these post the testing phase and still retain a large genetically diverse breeding population. And if the quality is good enough, it will become a tested seed orchard. But that will be 15, 18 years down the line post testing. So the birch progeny trials that we're about to put out, we, we, birch has typically been a northern species for us, but we're wanting to include some trees from England and Wales. And we've only got a few of these within our database of plus trees. And these are examples of our birch plus trees. And, and here is a climber climbing the, uh, the tree to collect the seed. But we really need a few more um, from England and, and Wales, south of the Lake District, um, to increase the genetic composition of our progeny trials. So if you know of, um, if you manage forests or you know where there's some particularly fine examples of silver birch plus trees, we'd really like to hear from you because we're hoping to be collecting the seed from these later on this, this summer, early autumn. I'm just briefly going to mention the Living Ash project. This is very exciting. We're in the second phase of this project. Uh, originally it ran 2013 to 18, funded by DEFRA. At the end of that project, we'd identified 400 plus trees that we planted in a, an archive on the public forest estate. At the same time, forest research were carrying out their mass screening trials where they planted 155,000 trees that were in the nurseries at the time that ash dieback hit. And they've been screening these trees over a number of years. And at the end of those two original projects, They've come together to form the Living Ash Project Phase 2. Again, we're funded by DEFRA. Thank you very much, DEFRA. And we're, we're working also with Thera, who are going to be carrying out something called liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, which is like a chemical fingerprint of all these trees to look for compounds associated with tolerance. But all of these trees have been grafted onto rootstocks of ash. And there's no guarantee that that rootstock has any tolerance whatsoever. So we're really quite keen to develop um, cuttings, veg prop techniques, so that we can take cuttings rather than grafting to get the trees onto their own roots. And we're delighted that Q have joined the programme and they will be carrying out that work. We have a project website, which is live, livingashproject.org.uk. And it's, it's quite a small website and it just has what we're doing. But in, in that website, we've got our reporter tree. And we really hope that managers uh, who, who have ash in, as a major component in their woodland don't go in and do a full sanitary fell for ash unless there are really strong health and safety reasons to do so, but that they use a more sympathetic approach, cull the most dangerous trees or the most heavily infected trees, but keep an eye out for those one to two percent of trees that we know um, are really healthy and show good tolerance to ash dieback. And you can see in the little uh, thumbnails below, you can see the 10% crown dieback in, in the ash. And that's the sort of tree that we're really looking for. So the casual eye, it actually doesn't look like it's infected. And on the website, we have this, this form, and we really hope that you use it to report trees to us, because we already know that the archive, the trees were selected in 2017, it was planted uh, January 2019, and we already know that not all these selections are as tolerant as we'd hoped they would be. So, you know, with nature doing further screening, we can alter the composition of that archive with an aim to um, getting more tolerant trees so that we can start a breeding program for ash. I'm just going to briefly mention the National Tree Improvement Strategy. This was launched in 2017 by Future Trees Trust in partnership with Comfort and Forest Research. And it aims to promote UK trees through a selection uh, and breeding of a wide range of species. So this isn't just broadleaves, this includes the Conifer Co-op, anybody interested in, in tree improvement, and obviously includes conifers as well as broadleaves, with the aim of promoting the economic value and genetic diversity leading to species resilience. And a major aim of it is to make sure that this material is available to anybody who's interested and wants it. And just to mention another strategy launched in 2018, and this is the UK Forest Genetic Resource Strategy, um, which uh, we didn't have for the UK. And this was uh, led by Q, by Claire Trevetti from Q, uh, with partners CEH, Future Trees Trust, the Woodland Trust, and of course, Forest Research with five main goals, a collaboration for change, that people become more aware of the role that forest genetic resources play, because this, it underpins everything we do. Um, communicating the value of this and promoting its use. Commissioning and coordinating new research. 
And importantly, uh, the in situ and ex situ, ex -situ conservation um, of, of forest regenerative resources uh, done through gene conservation units or the ex situ is sort of work that Future Trees Trust does. And my colleague Joe has been instrumental in bringing all the data from all these partners together and making this live on a web based platform. And he's going to be talking to you about that later on. So just to sum up what we've achieved in uh, the last 30 odd years, we've got uh, over 1400 plus trees for our seven main commercial species on our database. There's a continued push for more seed stands, not just of our major species, that 147 is for the major species to work with, but we really need to start thinking about more minor species uh, to help uh, augment the amount of tree species that people can plant to make more resilient woodlands. We've got 16 clonal seed orchards on the register. We're working on downy birch um, seed orchards and, and the oak ones, as I mentioned. And of course, the very important progeny trials uh, that's, that uh, underpin everything that we do to make those, those gains in, in tree improvement. And here's a lovely map that, again, Joe put together for us, all the different trials that show the uh, vast spread of, of the area that we, the, we work in. So I think that's all I have to say for now. Thanks very much for listening, and I'll pass back to Tim. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. That's fascinating. Fascinating stuff. Um, we've had a couple of questions come up in the in the Q and A box. One, an interesting one from John Weir. Hi, John. Good to hear from you. We will be addressing all the questions or as many of the questions as we can in a Q and A session at the end. But John had an interesting question about the the silver birch provenance trials at Thetford, which we will um, get back to you on later on in the later on in the in the webinar, John. Okay, so. Um, Joe mentioned um, our um, PhD student, Ryan McClury. Um, Ryan's recently completed a master's degree at Stockholm University, where his thesis was around oak phenology. Um, he's also co-authored in uh, one published paper and was the lead author for another. Um, his PhD is also supported by the Patsy Wood Trust grant. Um, Ryan's gonna tell us about, about that. Over to you, Ryan. Thank you very much. I'll just go and share the screen, like so. Right, perfect. Okay, so yes, hello everyone. Uh, I'm here to talk a bit about my PhD that I've recently started, Understanding the Drivers of Oak Mastery in the UK. So yes, as I said, so I originally did a, a undergrad degree in conservation biology at the University of Plymouth. I then went on to do my master's at Stockholm University, and I am now doing my PhD at Reading University under Professor Richard Ellis, Professor Martin Lukak, and I have Dr. Joe Clark as my Future Trees Trust uh, supervisor. So first of all, I should introduce Oak Mastin. This is essentially, you can uh, define it as spatially synchronous and temporally quasi-periodic production of seeds. This is a complicated way of saying that oaks will produce all their acorns in sort of large bumper years, followed by years of much lower acorn supply. And we can see this, this is just taken from social media uh, here from the Oxfordshire Woodland Group, and it shows a huge amount of acorns that can be produced in a mast year, just quite a small area. So there's a few different ideas as to why this has come about from evolutionary uh, roots. So one idea is predator satiation, the idea that essentially many years of low acorn production starve seed predators, and then when a mast year comes along, essentially the predators are very quickly satiated. This increases the survivability of the individual acorn. There is another idea that is more to do with just pollination efficiency. This idea that if all oaks flower at the same time, then they'll all pollinate each other's flowers more efficiently. Therefore, you just, when you have this alignment and synchrony between trees, that you get these occasional mast years. So why is understanding mast in important? So as Joe's already discussed a little bit, uh, oaks have recalcitrant acorns. So they're susceptible to dry out and they can't be stored for long periods of time. This is an issue because obviously oaks only mast in the UK maybe every four to seven years or so. So any acorns that you want to use for forest management, conservation, generally selling in seed orchards, they all have to be taken from this year's crop. Or if you can't take it from this year's crop, you've got to try and source them from elsewhere. Uh, the issue here being, if you take acorns from elsewhere, they're not necessarily well adapted to the UK climate. So they can produce oaks generally is not a good health or not able to deal with the UK climate as well. So we need to understand the sort of mechanistic drivers behind masting so we can better understand how to 
manage it. So there's too many different hypotheses as to what the mechanistic drivers could be. So I can't go into all details of them now, but I can loosely say they can be split into these areas. So it could be to do with the internal resources of the tree, this idea that maybe it's to do with the water supply going in, the nutrients being stored or being used in certain years. There's these ideas that it's more linked with weather, possibly like a warm spring, for instance, causing synchrony across the UK and resulting in masting. Or it could be something to do with pollen limitation, possibly a slightly stranger in a wind pollinated species. But certainly there are studies that point to these ideas that it could be, yes, limits in pollen in some years, meaning no mast years, and then more pollen in other years resulting in masting. So with these sort of mechanistic ideas in mind, there are a few questions to answer. So for instance, very few studies so far have been able to consider all these three areas in combination. It proves quite a few logistic difficulties to be able to really study these in depth. In particular, we lack specific study on the UK species. Quite a lot of of these studies focus in places in Europe, whether it be Spain or Poland, there's quite a lot of studies in mast in America, but relatively few in the UK. Another important question is working out at what stage acorn production is evolving. So we can see here I've got oak flowering up to early acorn development and then late acorn development, but at this point a herbivore's attacked it, which was preventing that acorn from obviously going on to the next stage. So at what particular point is a mast year cancelled essentially? And then with that in mind, are there any intervention measures that can be taken that will prevent this early acorn abortion? Importantly, there is quite a lot of individual variation in trees, even though it's a synchronous process where generally you get this idea that a whole area will mask at the same time, it still varies quite a lot in acorn production. So this is taken from White and Woods, where I have a field site there. So I went and collected data on acorn numbers for each of my trees, and even from this this graph on the left, we have acorn numbers on the left, and then uh, just on the x-axis, we have all my different tree numbers. We can still see this huge variation in, in terms of acorns being produced for each individual tree. And this is from the mast year, last year. And on the right, we have the spring phenology that I've been recording. And this shows sort of this huge variation still, even in the spring phenology of trees. It might be a bit hard to see the picture, but essentially this tree on the left is very far ahead. It's got flowers, it's producing lots of leaves. Meanwhile, the exact same species of tree just on the right, very dormant still. It later on uh, produced leaves, but much, much later than the other. And it could be this variation in spring phenology has a knock-on effect later on on how many acorns are produced for each individual tree. So with these sort of ideas and these questions in mind, we can split my PhD into three main projects. So this focuses on study one, which is how individual variation in acorn crop is a product of the abiotic and biotic environment. Then we go more nationwide and we look at study two, which looks at how abiotic and biotic factors affect acorn production across the whole of the UK. And then taking these ideas from study one and study two, study three talks about what intervention measures can be taken to improve acorn production. So just to go into a bit more detail of each of my studies, Study one, as I said, was how individual variation in acorn crop was a product of the abiotic and abiotic environment. The idea of this study is a multi-year, multifactorial observational study, uh, looking at individuals from the same population, in this case, white and woods. I'm aiming to have a good quantitative description of the whole process of acorn development that begins right as when spring phenology starts and flowers start emerging, all the way to when acorns eventually fall in the autumn. And I'm hoping to be able to pair this with lots of explanatory data, whether it be to do with the weather of the area, whether it do in terms of the different variation in phenology of the trees, for instance, whether that could have an impact. So, so far I've gone to White and Woods and I've chosen my 40 trees across my site. And as I've already said, here on the right, I've already taken visual counts of the acorns on the, uh, on the oaks. Um, further from that, I've started taking canopy photos of the area to get an idea. So this is on the top left here of your screens. This gives an idea of future tree growth. It will give an idea of canopy growth, maybe a bit of health, and give leaf area indexes. Uh, I've attached tiny taggers, which is here on the top right, and these will give me ideas of temperature and humidity on a sort of more microclimate scale. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to be allowed access to the walkway at White and Woods. It's very, very nice being up there. Essentially, they've built scaffolding right to the top of the trees, 
So you can go there to the left, and I've been following the spring phonology uh, of these trees. Uh, this obviously given an idea of whether that later affects acorn production or lasting. And obviously, as I do need an idea of acorn production each year, I've set up lots of litter traps here on the bottom right from my trees, and they will essentially be catching all the acorns. And from there, I'll be able to get an idea of sort of seed predation and herbivory there as well. So more then on study two. So this is the more na nationwide uh, study that looks at the abiotic and biotic factors affecting acorn production across the UK. So this national study, I'll be getting historic data on acorn production and hopefully pairing this with sort of data at a slightly wider scale that gives an idea in terms of remote sensing data. So I compare this with remote sensing data, the characteristics of the woodland or the soil or any climatic variables. I'll be able to hopefully create models of this that give an idea not just in terms of which weather variables or typologies would create these mast years in the UK, but also give an idea as to what this will look later on under climate change, whether masting will become more or less common, for instance. So in terms of the data I've been able to collect for this so far, I've been very fortunate. Uh, four stars have been very useful, pointing me in all the right directions. And I got was able to get quite a lot of data on the certified seed collections from the Forestry Commission. And this is just displayed here on the right. It just gives an idea of how much seed is collected. I'm, ho I'm hoping to clarify this slightly more in terms of whether there are areas where they weren't collected from because there wasn't any acorns or whether merely they'd reached how many acorns they were supposed to collect for that area for that year, etc. And I'm hoping to be able to collect more data from areas like the Web of Science, where you can look at different literature that's published and get an idea whether there are different areas of masters in the UK. So with this acorn production data across the UK, I'm hoping to compare this to expansory variables, where it be data from the Met Office, which gives the idea of weather and uh, data such as that. And then also using quite a lot of data from NASA, which gives, they've got lots of remote sensing data, uh, for instance, giving vegetation indices such as normalized different vegetation indexes and enhanced vegetation indexes. These are essentially just ideas of the growth of the canopy, the greening up of an area. Uh, they also have data on evapotranspiration and they can give ideas of leaf area index, which could be very useful. So from these two studies, I will then talk a bit about study three, which is what intervention measures can be taken to improve acorn production. So it's, it's difficult to talk too much about this study so far because it's very much going to be led by study one and study two. Um, so I've got to wait for the data to come in from there, and then I'll hopefully be able to come up with these intervention measures that can improve acorn production, whether it be on an increase in mast in frequency would be the ideal one, or if it's just, you know, increasing acorn production, even in mast years in certain areas. So, I mean, possible ideas there just from the literature is, you know, increasing water supply at key times could be quite important. It could be adding the correct nutrients at uh, certain times. Or it could be something more to do with trying to deal with the herbivores or seed predators uh, that attack. So that, that's sort of an overview of my PhD. Um, that's all I've got to speak about. But obviously, if you'd like any further discussion, do feel free to email me. Or if you've been collecting acorn production data for the last 50 years and haven't told anyone, that would also be quite nice. Um, but yes, I'd just like to thank everyone for listening and thank the supporters that enable this work well, the whole of Future Trees Trust to continue. I'll now throw it back over to Tim. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. That's great. And uh, how lovely to be able to say to all my friends that Future Trees Trust is working with NASA. Fantastic. Um, OK, um, um, on to our next scientist. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to Sam Henderson. Sam's a, a research engineer at Forest Research and the University of Surrey, where he's um, studying drought effects on oak, which Joe has, um, has, has alluded to in her presentation. Um, over to you, Sam. Hi, everyone. Just share my screen with you. Okay, um, so thank you all for coming and uh, welcome to my talk on uh, effectively drought in oak. So I'm coming to the end of my doctoral research, um, which took place uh, mostly at Forest Research, where I was part of the Timber and Wood Properties team. Um, and that was in collaboration with University of Surrey and of course, uh, part funded by Forest uh, Future Trees Trust. So what is it that I was looking at in oak? Well, I was looking at sessile oak, 
And I did this in two different ways. Uh, I did medical imaging. I used the MRI machine, like you find in a hospital. I did some computational modeling. Now, we've already talked a bit about um, viewing the tree phenotypically. My presentation is more about looking at the wood properties of individual trees. So um, instead of trying to look at the whole tree, we're going to look at parts of the tree that might make the whole tree interesting later. So for example, we're going to look at things like vessel size or the amount of water in trees, things you can't see from the outside. Let's go, there we go. Now, why do we care about drought in oak? So what you've got in front of you on the left-hand side is actual um, climate modeling data from uh, the Met Office. So in about 40 years time, it's quite likely that most of the South of England and the South of Wales will be suffering from um, a negative precipitation rate anomaly, which is to say the rainfall will be about uh, 10 to 20 to 40 percent less. Now there is a chance it'll get wetter and a chance it'll get drier, much drier than indicated here, but this is a kind of average estimation of um, what the rainfall will look like in the future. On the right hand side we have the distribution of native oak, now I include a sestile oak and um, all the other native oaks in the UK on this map just because Really, this is a thing that affects all the oaks. It just so happened to be that I studied sessile oak. And we can see that there's quite a big overlap in the regions that are affected by this negative precipitation rate anomaly. And in fact, in the distribution of native oak, which you can see um, is quite heavily concentrated in the, in the south of England and in Wales. Right. That means that drought is more likely. And you've also got to couple the fact that this is negative precipitation rate anomaly with the fact that increased temperatures mean the soil dries faster, et cetera. So the tree gets even less water than it would before and uh, increased summer temperatures and things like that increase the transpiration rate. So the tree is losing more water and receiving less. It can be quite a, a dangerous combination. Now we don't know for sure what the possible implications of drought are on trees, but we can say a few things. So um, there is this association as Joe mentioned earlier between vessel size and shape. Now, we think this might be associated with drought because the vessels are the water carrying elements in the tree. And of course, that is the uh, component of the tree that drought would affect. So drought would change the water content or the pressures in these vessel carrying elements. Why do we care about shake? Fundamentally, shake can cause problems, as Joe said, with um, trees falling apart on the summoning line, which leads to uh, inefficiencies in processing, wood processing. And there's the fact that if you have significant ring or star shake, like shown on this uh, photo here, you can actually massively decrease the value of the tree because instead of being used for high, um, you know, high-end buildings or furniture, the tree gets uh, used uh, either for, you know, for fencing or for firewood, um, which are much lower economic value products. Now, another thing that um, drought has been associated with is acute oak decline, which once again is going to hinder the growth of the tree and cause economic damage. So how did I go about studying drought in those trees? Now, what I did is I basically took nine trees uh, for my experiment and I kept three of them very, very happy. I made three of them slightly sadder by giving them less water and three of them I gave no water to at all. Uh, and that meant that they were, you know, effectively it was a drought simulation. I ran this at the Forest Research Growth Room uh, up at the Forest Research's Northern uh, Research Station near Edinburgh and um, in Roslyn. On the left hand side you can see uh, these trees on some funny stands and this is about halfway through the experiment so the tree in the foreground is actually suffering quite badly some of the trees in the background are prospering. Now you'll see the trees in these funny stands and you'll see why in a minute. The stands are what allow me to look inside the tree inside my MRI machine. So on the left hand side, we have the tree hugger, which is a purpose built MRI machine for looking at the inside of trees. Now, uh, the trees on those stands, like you saw on the previous slide, I'll just go back to it, are wheeled into the tree hugger. And uh, I did this at continuous intervals for about 120 days uh, during my experiment for all the trees. So all nine trees were wheeled into this on a kind of daily or semi daily basis. Now, what you get when you take an image um, using the tree hugger is uh, you see the water inside the trees. You don't see the wood so much as you see the water. And uh, I've got some example trees. So tree J was one of my drought treatment trees. And uh, the first image here before a drought treatment is the tree um, just a few days in when I just stopped watering it, but it was still very healthy and happy. And we can see that um, 
the bright white um, pixels on the image indicate the tree is it's got quite a lot of water in it. Now, 106 days later, drought tree J had been, um, well, it was suffering quite badly. It had um, most, most of the canopy had gone. And we can see that the water content inside the tree is actually much less because the, the image is so much less bright. And that's the example of the kind of things you can get at the tree hugger. So what did I discover by doing this experiment over 120 days? Well, one of the most interesting things I discovered about these um, sessile oaks is that the water content in the vessels, so that's the water carrying units, cells inside the tree, could drop by as much as 35% and still recover to their original value. And that tells us some things about the tree from a physiological perspective, which is to say that either the vessels are getting a little bit smaller, because um, I'm looking at the tree, if we go back to this image, uh, cross sectionally. So if you imagine from the top down, so if there's less water in the tree, it must uh, the vessels must either be getting smaller or the water is emptying out of these vessels and then refilling. However, once I get beyond this kind of 30, 35% point, it appears as though uh, the trees can't recover. And this raises the interesting question of why does the process become irreversible? Uh, and that's probably because the hydraulic damage is severe enough that the vessels are emptying and then um, basically they can't refill. The next thing I discovered, or um, this is getting a little less um, quantitative now and a bit more qualitative, is that we saw complete canopy loss and recovery in uh, one specimen and nearly complete canopy loss and recovery in other specimens, which to me was very interesting um, with a physics background uh, as opposed to a, a tree health background, uh, because I wonder, is this defoliation um, the cause of the damage or is it a useful drought coping strategy that could be bred into trees, etc.? So that's perhaps one to answer. And the last thing I discovered is I remember I had this stress group. I hadn't talked much about the stress group. And really what was most interesting about the stress group is despite the fact that there was very, very low soil moisture content and we had a lot of wilting and canopy loss, they didn't actually lose any internal water content. So these trees clearly preserved their um, internal water content as a big priority, but they did suffer from the canopy loss, as I mentioned, and there was a lot of infection. So it's still not a good thing for these trees to have low soil moisture contents. Uh, the last thing we're going to talk about in my project was SALFEM. SALFEM is my, um, it's going to be an open source model in MATLAB and it's going to be, the idea is that it will be used by researchers to look at the stresses and strains in the wood cell wall during drought events. So we'll start on the left hand image here. You can see um, this is some hardwood um, micrographs. So, you know, someone's cut the tree um, across the cross section and then uh, we can see what a, you know, a dizzying variety of different um, cell wall constructions we can have. So Zalfem is a program that allows you to draw or import these uh, wood geometries and then model the effects that drought would have on the wood cell wall. Uh, so for example, we took I, the, on the right hand side, you've got these red, green, blue images that I've effectively drawn in a program like Paint and they're importable into the model. Now the green on both these pictures is um, where air has seeped into the tree. So we've basically got an embolism where we've had drought. Uh, and the blue is where we've still got lots of water. So I'm going to show you a video based on um, one of these pictures now, which is the model running. And then you can see why it's so interesting. So as we watch the video, we can see that the uh, central vessel, the largest vessel, this is the vessel that I've emptied. And we can see that the negative pressures in the um, vessel adjacent to it are causing it to deform. Now, the good thing about this program is that we can import lots of different wood geometries. Um, so we can see if different wood geometries change the stresses and the deformation inside the wood structure. And they would see, we can see if these different wood geometries would make shape more or less likely. So for example, um, we can see if large, so as it is actually as two large adjacent vessels, there's a lot more displacement than there would be for a large vessel and small vessels around it or um, two medium-sized vessels. But we can basically look at realistic wood geometries and try and say which ones are more or less likely to uh, have cell wall deformation problems, which could eventually lead to things like uh, shake by um, through cell wall cracking. Okay. So uh, thank you all very much for listening to my talk. Um, I just want to thank my funders. So, um, I was funded by the EPSRC uh, through the University of Surrey and Forest Research. 
and of course um, the Future Trees Trust, uh, thank you very much for your um, support and that was a uh, part funded by Pat's Wood Trust I believe, so thank you all again. And uh, any questions please put them in the questions and answers and uh, we'll answer them at the end. Thank you, Sam. That's fascinating stuff. And indeed, uh, a couple of interesting questions have already come up from uh, John Weir and, and Roger Coppock, which we will um, address towards the end of the webinar. Thank you very much for that. I'd now like to introduce you to uh, Jonas Brandle. Jonas is our um, inaugural Patsy Wood Trust Scholar um, and was recruited through the Royal Forestry Society's Future Foresters Scheme, supported by the Patsy Wood Trust grant again. Um, a few words about uh, the, the Patsy Wood Trust scholarship which we launched in 2019 to provide a key career stepping stone for new um, entrants into the forestry sector. But the first position as I said went to Jonas, he's a graduate from Bangor University where he did an MSc in agroforestry. Jonas is going to tell us about his time as the inaugural Patsy Wood Trust Scholar. Over to you Jonas. Thank you very much Tim, hello and yes exactly I will share my presentation with you. Thank you very much for the introduction, um, Tim. Yes, now I'm going to speak about my experience during the Patsy Wood Scholarship and I will focus on a bit more practical stuff and also make the, the bridge to research and science and sharing knowledge in the sector. My background, so I have an undergraduate, uh, sorry, a bachelor's degree in um, forestry from uh, Freiburg University in the Black Forest and also studied international forestry and was keen to see forest, how that is approached in other countries and went to um, Wales to study agroforestry in more depth. Um, just to show you all the parties that have been involved in uh, the Patsy Wood Scholarship, um, obvious, obviously the funders and um, also my employers. Um, yeah, that you can see here. <laughs> um, so my experience with Somers Devon um, was very exciting, um, very much hands on. Um, and I was involved in managing forest for quality timber. So we, it was very interesting to see how uh, to select trees for, for end products and to always have the end product in mind when managing forest, while also sustaining future demands. So not always taking the best timber because there might be another usage in the future for it. And um, yeah, you can see there's a hardwood mill here, um, which can process very large sizes of timber, which might be becoming more relevant in the future with more broadleaf species and more uh, large size timber around. Um, on the left, you can see a picture of an oak stem that is not exactly what the Future Trees Trust is trying to gain through their breeding programs and tree improvement programs. Um, but uh, maybe not for, for the large majority of the market, but for quite a substantial market, also uh, nicely curved timber is very interesting and can be used for the growing timber frame building sector opposed to um, yeah, engineered wood products. Um, yeah, I was involved in a lot of practical um, exercises, but also some theoretical work. Um, I learned how to mark uh, stents in continuous cover forestry and, for example, selected trees for niche products like uh, sailing masts, which was very interesting work. And uh, did a lot of measuring and grading of round wood and, and eventually of sawn timber products. And uh, yeah, was also involved in the management of a large um, redwood stand in Dartington. Uh, obviously, I didn't fell that tree. You need a very experienced <laughs> um, chainsaw operator for that. Um, 
yeah, so it was great to engage with with forestry and with um, with wood in a more in-depth sense. Uh, my work with timber strategy was very different and focusing much more on deep questions how to do, how to approach forestry in the future and one of the key questions we had is how to bridge the gap between forestry and timber use so on the left you can see a broadleaf forest that looks uh, very lovely and we would like to 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 walk through it and um yeah to it probably has a has a high um biodiversity value and on the other hand we, we on the right hand side we can see um a timber building um the way we are building now we are building much more and uh yeah more this uh, engineered wood products and how does this fit together so we can be pretty sure here that uh, the woodland on the left hasn't supplied the timber for the building on the right probably this wood uh, woodland can supply the timber but that is not what we'd like to see in in lowland forestry at least and um but i'm sure um some uh, continuous cover stands can also supply that timber but we can also look at it from the other side and say um, yeah we could also build differently with timber here um, at woodland park uh, at hook park sorry um, uh, we can see that thinnings have been used and their natural properties the elasticity has been used in a very wise way um so how can we overcome the disconnection so i we believe um you need to to ask um well the forestry sector needs to ask themselves some questions so we spend so much time trying to um to produce quality timber in our woodland and then we just send the best uh, uh products and um, the best quality timber for refinement for engineered wood products yeah does that bother us if if, if the pr price is good um but we, i think we should concern ourselves with that because uh, yeah maybe maybe it, it makes more sense to supply um less good quality timber for for refinement and to use the best quality timber uh, uh, to the strengths of its natural properties here, just one example of my works with timber strategies, and um, you can see that um, yeah, we looked at uh, I looked at in a, in a more depth at a lot of species for a specific uh, site on a landscape scale to make planting recommendations. Of course, you need to actually access the site and make planting recommendation on a smaller scale, but as a first step, that can be quite helpful. And we were very progressive looking at a lot of species, some of the species you probably don't want to see in woodlands, some of them uh, uh, that might be an option in the future. And here the example of older and uh, yeah, we looked at the climate suitability, which is quite suitable we found for that site and that soil. Um, obviously you could improve the study with more um, more data probably probably from met office mm, yeah and then you can see some of the attributes of alder obviously uh, very helpful for increasing soil fertility and uh, also one of the species that has some um, can can replace some of the of the ecosystem services of ash but definitely not all and uh, yeah great work the future trees trust is doing on um, on the ash archive uh, which bridges the gap to to the, my next slide so one of the highlights of my trainings was assisting joe clark um, with the establishment of the ash archive and I'm really looking forward to the results of, of, 
of uh, yeah this archive and how it will evolve and i hope to see see a lot of um good uh, stock coming from there um another work of mine was to um look at tree improvement and forest genetics in germany and uh, hope that that work will also help the Future Trees Trust to, to uh, network uh, throughout, um, throughout Europe and also will help to, to um, yeah, to, uh, to, to, uh, yeah, network and so on, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, my path since then. So I've worked uh, after leaving. I worked um, after finishing the Patsy Woods Woodship, uh, Patsy Woods Scholarship. Sorry. <laughs> um, I worked for a landscape agency in a very different landscape, as you can see, on industrial and mining sites uh, with very difficult and part partly um, contaminated soils and was involved in afforestation and re-afforestation sites. Um, yeah, a smaller project of mine was uh, to, to help small projects to, to get the foot on the ground. And my aim was to um, yeah, share my knowledge, but most do relate to scientific papers. And in one example, we we established an agroforestry plot in Bonn in West Germany and were able to um, yeah, combine. They wanted to, to plant walnut on the one hand and at some point autumn olive came up and yeah, I came across the work of uh, Joe Clark and um, how to combine uh, these two, um, yeah, two plants in a, in a very benefiting way. Um, right now, I just started this week my new job um, with the Schutzgemeinschaft Deutscher Wald. So that's a society that aims to protect the German forest and uh, yeah, uh, is communicating the uh, is basically communicating forestry topics. And uh, quarterly, we will publish. Uh, small journal which isn't exactly scientific but based on scientific evidence but uh, aimed towards very different uh, target groups from children to more forest experts so yeah and that was that and i very much like to thank you for listening and obviously like to thank my funders the patsy wood trust the future trees trust and I'd also like to thank the Royal Forestry Society for their engagement. And of course, uh, Sommel Steven and Timber Strategies for the opportunity to work with them. And I had a very great time and I'm very happy to see that the Patsy Wood Scholarship continues and we have a new Patsy Wood Scholar. And yeah, thank you very much. And I hand over to Tim. Thank you, Jonas. It's, that's great. It's really lovely to see and to hear how much you enjoyed um, your time as the Patsy Wood Trust Scholar. And thank you for that neat introduction to James Cryer, who is our second Patsy Wood Trust Scholar. James, unfortunately, can't be with us today, but he has prepared um, a short video to show to you all to explain to you what he's been up to. Um, um, Georgina, can you cue in James's video? Thank you. Hi, I'm James Pryor, this year's Patsy Wood Scholar. This is a position funded through the Future Trees Trust in collaboration with the Royal Forestry Society and William Hamer, an independent forestry consultant from Berkshire. So I spend most of my time working as an assistant forest manager for William, covering all sorts of aspects of modern day forest management in Southern England. I also get generous training opportunities through the Future Trees Trust, learning about the genetic improvement of hardwood species for timber. My jobs as assistant forest manager are diverse and they're dependent on the time of the year. It's really nice being able to spend so much time outside and I think that my favourite job is probably marking thinnings, which involves selecting the worst trees so that we can promote the best in the stand. One of my favourite projects so far 
It's been the conversion of some red cedar trees from this stand here into these lovely feather edge boards. The reason I enjoyed it so much is that the trees were selected and sourced just a few hundred meters away. They were bought here and then using a mobile wood miser saw, they were milled into these lovely boards. The best thing about the project is that they're going to be used locally on the estate for renovation works as cladding. As a forest manager, it's my responsibility to make sure that I use the best genetic stock available to me at the time. It's important to know where the trees come from. Improved stock means that they're more productive, they produce better timber, there's less wastage and they sequester more carbon. The work of the Future Trees Trust is really important because forestry is a long game. We need to make sure that what we put in the ground is right first time. It's been really insightful working with Dr Joe Clark and Dr Beasley on the Oak and Sycamore Cottonwoods Trails seeing what goes on behind the scenes. I've really enjoyed my year as Patsy Wood Scholar so far and I feel very privileged to be able to learn about something I'm so interested in. It's fantastic that these sorts of opportunities are available for young foresters as we will be the ones making the decisions in the future. That's great. And th th there's another young forester clearly enjoying their time with Future Trees Trust. So thank you very much, James. Uh, and now, um, uh, as introduced by James there, I'd like to introduce you to our final speaker this morning. That's uh, Joe Beasley. Joe's our um, uh, recently appointed researcher at Future Trees Trust. He joined us after completing a PhD in biochemistry at Bristol University. And uh, Joe works supporting Joe Clark uh, with uh, fieldwork assessments and managing our various trials. His role too um, is supported by the Patsy Wood Trust. Joe, over to you. So hopefully um, that's come through. Thanks, Tim, for the introduction and welcome to you all today. Um, my talk, I'm going to be delving into two of the projects that Joe touched on in her talk and giving you a little bit more detail. Um, some recent results from our Sycamore Progeny Trials and then this online database we've created around uh, forest genetic resources. So project one are the our new Sycamore Progeny Trials, and this is work that's been supported by Baston Timber. And so Sycamore is a naturalised species in the UK, but it grows, grows very well here and across the entirety of the British Isles. It's also one of the fastest broadleafs uh, growing here, and so it can produce, produces very strong and workable timber very quickly, and the value of that timber can actually equal the value of oak or, or beech logs. Jonas touched on the potential ecological replacement for ash uh, that older can play. Well, Sycamore also plays, can also play a valuable role in this, um, this kind of a consortium strategy. And so there's going to be potential interest in this, in this species down the line as we unfortunately lose more ash woodlands to, to ash dieback. A couple of pictures here on the right hand side. This is one of our plus trees this is from southern England. And then on the left, um, these are cuttings that have been taken from such plus trees, grafted onto rootstocks and are growing on in the nursery ahead of being planted out at one of our archives or orchard sites. So the Sycamore Improvement Program has been going since about the early 90s. We've so far selected approximately 200 plus trees across uh, both Britain and Ireland. We've established six uh, seed orchards that are producing qualified seed that are operational now. Uh, three archives to kind of store and maintain this genetic material and more recently two small progeny trials that I'll be talking a little bit about today. So these were planted um, on the winter of 2015-2016 so they're now five years old. The plus trees and the various sites are shown in this map and so you can see the spread of plus trees across, across the country and Ireland and, and where our orchards and trials are located. And here's a photo from one of the seed orchards at Myler Nurseries in Shropshire, um, showing kind of how they're planted out there. So I'm going to focus on these two uh, progeny trials, and Joe's already uh, introduced the concept of progeny trialing earlier, but I'll just go through it again before I present further. So essentially what any tree looks like anywhere is a combination of its genetics and the environment in which it grows. This is a kind of nature nurture uh, idea. And what we're really interested in FTT is dis disentangling that and working out the genetic component of why our plus trees uh, look so good in the field. So progeny trials investigate this genetics uh, of plus trees by studying their offspring. And so the way that we do this is collect seed from a plus tree 
uh, raise that in the nursery. And then all of those seedlings that we raise from one tree, uh, they will have the same mother tree, which is the plus tree, will have different pollen fathers. And so they're referred to as half siblings and, and as a half sib family. By planting members of that family at different trial sites and monitoring how they grow and their, their growth and their form, we can work out, calculate things about the genetic quality of that parent plus tree and whether that parent plus tree should be included in seed orchards and, and in our program. So after we have done the progeny trialing, we can essentially rank the families that are being tested, the plus trees that are being tested, and those poorest ones then can then be removed from the seed orchards that are already existing, and that will improve the quality of the seed uh, being produced at those orchards and ele elevate their status from qualified to tested. And so the trials often look a little bit like this. This is a, a drone shot from the trial uh, in Ireland that I'll talk about in a second. And so each of those, uh, each of those guards contains one member of one half sib family, all randomized across the site. So these two trials uh, that we've planted recently for Sycamore, they're located uh, in Northern Ireland at Armoy, and the second one, the Bathurst Estate in Gloucestershire. And there, there's about 40 families that are being tested here. So they're a little small, but they can still reveal a lot of important information. And of those 40 families, I think there's 31 that are common to both sites. Here's some photos of what the sites look like. So the Armour site obviously is higher latitude in the land. It's also slightly higher elevation, and a little bit more exposed. The Bathurst estate is, is kind of sheltered lowland site. And so what we did over the winter just gone is we collected five year data at both these sites. And what we collected uh, was the height, which is obviously a very important factor when you're looking at, at breeding trees for timber. We want trees that are gonna grow uh, quickly into good heights. And so here, this is James measuring the height of this tree with the telescopic pole. We also measured the diameter at breast height, because as well as uh, height, we want to have trees that have good girth to them. And then finally, we looked at the form, which is also of crucial importance. And so we're looking at a, we're giving a kind of general overall form score with particular interest on the apical dominance, which is how the leader grows through uh, each, each growing season. And so the tree that James is measuring there has excellent apical dominance and excellent form. We're also recording any forking that might have occurred. And so I'm just gonna show you some of the early results. So we've done a little bit of analysis on this. And so first, if we compare the two sites, what we've got here is a histogram showing along the x-axis is the height of tree and then y is the number of those trees uh, of that height. So if you look at the armoy first, you can see that actually the majority of the trees are under two meters in height, whereas at Bathurst the trees are, are much, much larger. The average tree is around three meters tall and we actually have a small population that are over five meters tall after five growing seasons. So the trees are growing very rapidly at Bathurst, um, a bit less so at Armoy. We can do the same kind of uh, comparison with the form data. So the yellow bar, yellow section of this bar graph is trees that have scored a perfect form score and then working up to kind of dark purple. And so there's clearly clear differences again in the site with around two thirds of the trees at Bathurst scoring a kind of perfect form score, less than a quarter of those at Armoy uh, and many more trees at Armoy scoring a poorer form score. So not only are the trees growing uh, taller they're also growing with much better form at the site in Bathurst as well. And so we haven't looked into too much detail as to why this might be, but it was certainly a combination of those, the kind of exposure, the elevation um, differences in those two sites. What's really important is whether there are families, plus tree families at these two sites, which are starting to, to perform really well. And if we're starting to see some kind of ranking of those families um, at the individual sites. So here on the left is the same map of the British Isles again, this time with the, the plus trees that are common to both sites. And on the right, we have a table where each of those codes uh, represents one plus tree and therefore one family, one house of family. And then we're just looking at the five year height here, um, firstly of Armoy. And so each family, the family mean is colored with uh, red, dark red at the island control being the smallest family all the way up to dark green being the tallest family. And so you can see that there are some trees, a lot of the island trees that towards the bottom of the table are below average. 
and some of the trees from Northern England are, are kind of above average. But if we compare the, this Armoy data to the same grading for Bathurst, we can start to see that there are families here which are performing poorly at both sites, uh, which have red, you know, red bars across both sites. But there are many that are performing very well at both sites, um, particularly Island 31 down towards the bottom of the table and an Island 4. And so these are the families that we're really interested in because despite very large differences in site performance, there are families that are already starting to, to outperform the other families across the sites. So in summary of this section, the, the our project trial is now only five, five years old, but, um, but survival is high. We've recorded growth and form data, and although there's large differences, we are starting to see these families that are, that are kind of standing out, which is, which is really encouraging to see. The next assessment will be in 2026, where we're recording 10-year data, and we'll see if these trends kind of maintain. We can update you then. The second project I'm going to talk about today is the uh, Forest Genetic Resources project that Joe mentioned, and this is a big cross-institutional uh, cross project um, looking at these. So the first important question then is what are forest genetic resources? Uh, they're essentially anything from a, any plant matter, material from a woodland that has genes and can pass those on to the next generation. So this can be trees, such as our, our plus trees we've selected, or ancient and veteran trees. They can be woodlands, uh, that have been selected for conservation interest or that have been planted, so such as our trials, seeds that have been collected for storage, and then cuttings that have been taken and grafted. And it's any of these, these things that are working to understand, to conserve, or to utilise the genetic diversity that we find within the biodiversity of the UK. And so we all kind of appreciate the importance for ecosystems of, of having high biodiversity. And we often think about this in terms of species diversity, which is obviously is incredibly important. But just as critical is the underlying genetic diversity that we find within each of those species, because that's what gives those species the uh, ability to adapt and evolve to changing climate or changing threats. And it also provides a very broad base um, for tree improvement programs to maximize uh, the aims they're trying to achieve. And so led by Q and along with Forest Research Wooden Trust and CEH, FTT contributed to strategy for UK forest genetic resources, which you can find at the URL up there. And this is a kind of unifying strategy on how we're going to understand, conserve and, and, make, and make use of in a sustainable way, the resources that we have in this country. And so what FTT have been doing recently to contribute to this uh, strategy is we've been pulling together all of these different types of resources that I talked about onto an online database. And this uh, is presented in a map, in a map format. So they're kind of pins on a map. And we have separated into two separate maps. The first of those is research trials. And this contains a lot of the, the utilization, understanding trials, orchards, archives, and plus trees. And then we have a second more conservation focused map, which contains the genetic conservation units, which are woodlands, particular woodlands that have been designated as areas of importance for a particular species or multiple species. And this is part of a European wide program. And also locations where seeds have been collected for Q's National Tree Seed Project to be stored at the Millennium Seed Bank at Wakehurst. And the hope is that with this, with all these resources available and viewable, that it will facilitate kind of improved research cross collaboration like cross cross institutional collaboration and, and drive forward this work with UKFGR. And so what I'm going to do now is just give you a brief demo of the map um, to show you what we've got on there and, and how you can how you can use it. So I'm just going to stop sharing and switch over to that. So hopefully I've come through there all right and you should see hopefully this is the research research trials tab of the website. And if I scroll down, you see here is a, a kind of plug-in map, um, looking very much like a Google Maps with pins for each of the resources. And on the left-hand side, we have a legend that shows these. We have a drop-down where you can select and filter via species. And then we have a layer for the regions of provenance, which you can toggle on and off. And so these are the regions of the country uh, kind of air grouped for seed uh, collection, seed 
the solution. And so if we, we can use these checkboxes here to filter the map so we can deselect all of the pins and then bring in just the progeny trials. Then if we select, we filter by a sycamore, we can see the two progeny trials that I spoke about earlier in the talk. This map moves like any other interactive map. So you can zoom in and pan. And so if we zoom into the pin at Bathurst, we can see that come up here and we have information now in the left-hand panel about its design and its planting year. We also have information on the data that's been collected at this trial. And so this isn't available directly through the platform, but if people would like to use this information for their own analysis and their own studies, then they're very welcome to get in touch with FTT and we will um, arrange that. There's also the conservation units tab as well, but just uh, aware of time, I will leave that one for you to go and explore yourself, but it works in very much the same way. So I'll just come back to my slides. So yeah, this has been a big project, pulling all these uh, resources together and presenting them in one place online for people to use. Here are some numbers about what we have up there at the moment. Uh, we're always looking for more. This is a, this is just started really. We have a lot of, F, we have all the FTT trials and some trials from FR uh, and obviously all of the data from Q collections and, and some from other organizations. But if you have any other resources of, of this type, we'd love to hear from you and including these in some way. So that just leads me to thank a, a bunch of people behind both these projects, uh, Andrew Clark and the Bathurst Estate, uh, particularly Ian Garrett who manages the site there, uh, our landowners for the progeny trials and always very grateful to those people. Uh, Rodrigo and the staff at AFBI and James helped with data collection. For the UK FGR project, Pete Bishop at Banyan Design developed the website and the, and the map itself. The whole UK FGR group, and in particular Stephen Cavers, Joan Cottrell and Ted Chapman, who provided data. Woodland Heritage, Trees for Life have also provided some of their pins, um, which is really great. And DEFRA provided some funding to in include the, the second map. And thanks also to the Patsy Wood Trust, um, all FTT funders, and uh, to you all for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions. So thanks a lot, and I'll pass back to you, Tim. Cheers. Thank you, Joe. That that's brilliant. Um, I wanted to wrap up at, at midday, but it's um, so we've got five minutes to cram in some some questions and some thank yous. Um, we may well overrun. I hope that's okay with everybody because we've had some some really interesting questions come in. Um, I'll take these in um, in no particular order. Uh, this is one from from John Weir, uh, probably for you, Joe Clark. Um, the silver birch provenance trials at Thetford um, are showing really positive, um, hopeful results. Um, can we, first of all, I should have said, can I invite all of the speakers to unmute themselves, please, so that we can, we can all um, answer these questions if we need to. Thank you. So, Joe, sorry, I was saying Silver Birch Providence Trials at Thetford showing um, uh, great potential. Are they a source of um, plus trees? John Weir would like to know. Yes, indeed. The um, trials and Steve Lee has actually written a paper on this. We've gone back to Steve's paper and looked at the performance of the individual provinces. But rather than going back to the trials, John, we're going to go back to this, the origin where the uh, stand was originally collected from and select the best trees within the stand. And in fact, we've, we've actually already been to the Central Forest District and had a look at some of their stands um, because you don't know the pollen source within, within the trials themselves. You don't know where the pollen is coming from. It could be next to a really poor tree or it could be next to a foreign tree within the province trial. So we will go back to the original site and select best trees. But it's a good suggestion, but one we'd already thought of, thanks. Thank you, Joe. Uh, a question from Christine Cahalan uh, for you, Ryan. How old are the um, study trees at Whitton Woods? Yeah, it's, it's a fairly good consideration because it's something that I think a lot of people forget when they uh, do their studies. So uh, especially stand age as well. So it is a fair mix of the trees I chose. I may sort of choose above a certain age. I was going off just using BPH as a proxy because obviously these younger trees can be a lot more variable. Um, so, I mean, there's some that are in there, I think, planted in the 1950s, 1970s, and there's some ancient woodland that, you know, they think might have been there since the last ice age. So, uh, you know, it's a nice mix in the whole woodland, but generally I think I chose trees around the sort of 200 BBH mark, somewhere around there. So, you know, all hopefully the sort of same age-ish of my trees. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, Joe Clark, another question for you. This one from Steve Lee. 
uh, who, who says that the, the area of oak seed orchards clearly required is massive. Uh, and do we have any plans for micro or macro propagation to, to, to boost those um, to boost those numbers? That's a, a good question, Steve. Um, we we did a, a research, we commissioned Rick actually to do a research, a literature review on different methods of veg prop in oak and cuttings did seem to be the way going forward so that you can take your improved acorns maybe and, and grow them and, and take cuttings from them to bulk up that improved material. Um, I know Trevor, well I think Trevor at Forest Research, it might be a question for Gustavo actually, has done some uh, tissue culture work on, on, on oak, but it's quite tricky to do and uh, oak is, seems to be a notoriously difficult species to work with throughout. So directly uh, we ourselves will not be doing that because we don't have the, that, that area of expertise, but it's something that I think uh, more work would be welcome on. I don't know if Gustavo wants to chip in there. Uh, I think, is he here? To, I'm not sure he's here today. But. Well, if, if we if we can't answer these questions um, today, then we will make sure that all any answered any unanswered questions and any further explanation will be will be issued um, in due course. Um, I've got a question here that um, Roger Coppock and John Weir both asked very similar questions to you, Sam. Um, have we looked at oak growing in um, areas that have what are predicted to be our future climate, hot and dry? And should we be using different or more southern provenances for our oaks? Yep, uh, I see those two questions. Uh, hi there. Oh, I want to get a bit better. There we go. Um, yeah, there are actually quite a lot of oaks in dry and arid regions. Um, there are oaks in California and in France, as mentioned, that do very well. Um, although for the most part, I think there would be non-native uh, species for the UK, although Cessar oak is a bit over the place. Uh, no, I haven't looked at them. It would be very interesting to see what their wood properties were like. And, um, you know, for example, if this idea of vessel area uh, causing shakers of thing, have they actually got different size vessel areas uh, in these provinces? As I say, with the caveat that we'd have to look at ones that were the same uh, type of oak, you know, sessile or um, etc. I'll, Thank just you, I'll just chip in there, Tim. Okay, yeah. In our oak breeding programme, we have a number of Petraea that have been selected from um, northern France. And we also have a number of Roba that were all selected from the Netherlands. And almost uniformly, the, the trees from the Netherlands have got very, very large vessel sizes. And yet in the Netherlands, they report that their oak is never shaken. Whereas our Petraea, uh, the, Fr the French Petraea, uh, even compared to the English portrayer, they've got very, very small vessel sizes. But what we've not been able to do is go back and look at those French trees growing in situ and see if those are shaken. So we're, we're also really interested in the results of Sam's PhD because it, it is a confounding problem within the oak breeding programme. Thank you. Another, another question from Steve um, for you, Ryan. Um, Steve wants to know, are mast years common countrywide or do different stands mast in different years? And what do we, um, are we, are we considering soil type and water level? Yeah, so it's one of those things where, oh, bit of an echo again. Uh, it's one of those things where the sort of, the easy answer is yes, they do all sort of synchronize over these large areas. So I was reading a study that talked about sort of a thousand kilometers is how far they'd, they'd uh, mast over. However, it, it's sort of a slightly simpler answer there because there is lots of variation, whether it be through the individual trees I talked about just in my study, or even, yes, some stands will mast in some years, some won't in other years. Um, it's even possibly a little hard occasionally to define a mast year, so of really good mast years are quite easy to sort of see where they are, but then occasionally there are all these middling levels where it's like, well, some areas have, some areas haven't. Um, so yeah, I think certainly looking at soil types and water tables, these will be sort of interesting ideas as to see whether this creates some of the variation in this mastic, because then you can get these ideas as to whether if there is variation caused by water tables, soil types, etc. That would suggest some sort of mechanistic link there that, you know, oh, it could be something to do with nutrients coming up with areas with more water, or if the soil's quite good, then it means that trees can sort of reset their nutrients after a mastic more quickly. Um, so yeah, so whilst generally there seems to be this large synchrony, um, it's not quite as simple as that. So yes, there is still this variation. I think that answers the question. Thank you, thank you Ryan. An interesting question from Amanda 
to Brian, I'm not quite sure who, who to direct this to, possibly um, me and me and Joe, but in light of the England tree um, action plan that was launched yesterday, Amanda has asked, do we need a wood resource policy and action plan to, to follow the Swiss approach, which was um, making, um, uh, suggesting more planning for timber use? And I think the answer to that is categorically yes. That's not necessarily something that Future Trees Trust could or should be doing, but I think globally and nationally, there is definitely a need for a wood resource policy and action plan. I don't know any of the speakers have got anything to say about that or any suggestions that, that we can send to Amanda. I, I would say that it's not something we directly do at Future Trees Trust, but I think it's something that maybe could be considered and looked at through the National Tree Improvement Strategy, which aims to bring lots of people together, um, all, all sorts of organisations who have an interest in this, um, and that could, that could be something to be raised under that. It's, it's a really good suggestion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. Uh, one final question from John Tucker at the Woodland Trust. Hi, John. Um, who asked a really important question. How can we get more um, woodland owners to register their, their stands uh, as FRM sources? And um, would anyone care to answer that one? I'll have a go at that one. It's, it's, um, it's a little bit of a hot topic, John. It's a really good uh, thing to do, but it's something we've been trying to get landowners to do for a long time. We, we have a large database of landowners um, a lot of them are private landowners and a lot of them have some very very nice timber stands as you can imagine where we've selected um, our plus trees from but not everybody wants to manage their timber stand as a seed stand um, for it to be a, a really good seed stand as I mentioned you need to do regular heavy thinning you need to get those crowns opened up and you need to control your vegetation. And not all landowners want, want their details um, on the public register because the, the, the register of seed stands is managed by the Forestry Commission and it's open for any, anyone to view. Um, but it, it is a problem. And with this 30,000 hectares of new planting that's, that is, is called for by government, you know, where that seed is coming from it, it is a question. And, and we would urge, we do urge people to register any decent stands of timber they have. Um, and I think in Scotland, I'm going to say very cautiously, I think there's even a grant to help landowners um, manage their stands. I'm not sure if that's available in England, but uh, we, we certainly at FTT are constantly trying to promote more people to, to get their seed stands registered if they are willing to do so. Thank you. I, I think uh, we'd, we'd better wrap it up there. I think that's pretty much all the questions answered. Um, if there are any questions that have come in whilst we've been answering the questions, we will make sure that those are those are answered by by the relevant speakers in due course. Um, I'd like to say a huge thanks to 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 everyone that's attended and made it through to the end. I know that we're all getting pretty sick and tired of Zoom, so thank you for your commitment and your your patience this morning. A huge round of thanks to Georgina Thomas, who's our um, our social media and Zoom expert who created the event today and steered us all through the technology. Thank you very much, Georgina. Um, obviously, I'd like to thank all our supporters, without whom we wouldn't be here today. But as you've heard mentioned many, many times today, we'd like to say a special thank you to the Patsy Wood Trust, whose transformative grant a few years ago enabled many of the speakers to be here today. Um, and thank you all to, the, to everyone that's, that's spoken today. I know that um, you've all put in a huge amount of hard work to make today such a such a success and I'd like just to thank you all on behalf of Future Trees Trust. To everybody out there that's still listening, do please follow us on Twitter, sign up for our newsletter and I'd like to know about how you think it's gone today. You know, this is the first time we've, we've done a, a large scale webinar like this. It might not be the last. We're all very much looking forward to, to being um, in a room together this time next year, but you never know when we might need to have to do this again. I'd like to know what you think about it, please. Everyone that's attended today will receive a link to a recording of today's session. And you're also going to receive a PDF copy of our annual report, which we're going to publish later on today. So thank you very much to everyone for attending. I hope you found it interesting and informative. I certainly have. Um, we hope to see you all again soon uh, with a bit of luck um, in a field with some trees this time next year. Thanks again for coming. Goodbye. <laughs>